Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the first webinar in the Idwell Insights series focused on climate action, which is a running programme of content planned to help tackle a number of the issues and challenges that the shipping industry faces as we strive towards a more sustainable future. My name is Adam Compton and I'm the Head of Sales here at Idwell and it's my pleasure to be your host today as we talk about decarbonisation and more specifically, asking one of the burning questions in the industry at the moment, what is EEXI? I'm joined by my colleague, Stefan Henry, who will be guiding you through this topic. As a quick introduction, Stefan is our Head of Marine Standards and a Senior Marine Surveyor, with a background as a Chief Engineer and Refrigeration Engineer on board deep sea vessels. Stefan heads up our decarbonisation services and is technical lead on all things EEXI. Before we begin, as I'm sure many of our viewers are, I'd just like to highlight that we are working remotely. And although we don't foresee any issues, I do apologize in advance in case of any technical issues or background noise that might disrupt the presentation. If I could, can I please ask that everyone remains muted for the duration of the webinar? And any questions can be typed into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the Q&A session at the end of the show. I'll now hand over to Stefan, who will be answering the question of the day, what is EEXI? Thanks, Adam. So as Adam mentioned, we're looking at the Energy Efficiency Existing Ships Index, EEXI, which is one of two major regulatory changes approved by the IMO at the last Marine Environmental Protection Committee in June this year. Today, we're going to find out what it is, how it can be calculated, and what the requirements and timelines are. So what is the EEXI? Well, in effect, it's a calculated score to measure how energy efficient the design of a vessel is. It only applies to how the vessel is designed and what type of technology and equipment it has fitted, and not to how the vessel is run. It's the same as the EEDI, or the Energy Efficiency Design Index, in terms of its calculation, with some minor adjustments, but retrospectively applied to all existing vessels, and not those being built for which the EEDI score is applicable. In effect, this score has been in use for new build vessels since 2016, known as the EEDI. The unit of the score is grams of CO2 per capacity mile, effectively measuring how much CO2 the vessel produces to move a certain amount of cargo a certain distance. The amount of cargo is defined as the vessel's dead weight for cargo vessels, gross tonnage for passenger vessels. Therefore, the smaller the EEXI, the more energy efficient the vessel is. And here's the equation that is used to calculate it. It's quite intimidating when you first see it, but it's more straightforward than it looks. All these Fs are factors that adjust for various vessel features and types. The first bracket here calculates the theoretical carbon output from the main engine. The second bracket calculates the output carbon output for the auxiliary engines. The third one here accounts for any offset or increase of the carbon output due to shaft motors or energy efficiency technologies fitted to the auxiliary engines or electrical systems. And the final bracket offsets the carbon output due to any energy efficiency devices fitted to the main engine or to the hull. So now we know what the EEXI score is, what are the requirements? Well, the IMO have agreed on amendments to MARPOL that apply to all vessels above 400 gross tons. Although it's not strictly true, as some vessels with non-conventional propulsion will be exempt. This mostly applies to OSVs, PSVs, that have things such as azimuth thrusters, etc. But all other vessels will have to have the EEXI calculated and develop an EEXI technical file for the vessel. This calculated EEXI is known as the attained EEXI. This is the figure that's calculated using the equation on the previous slide. This technical file and the attained EEXI will then have to be verified by a recognized organization, more commonly known as class societies, and will have to be below the required EEXI which is defined by another calculation based on the vessel's type and dead weight. If the attained EEXI is above the required, then the vessel will require the installation of additional technologies to reduce the attained EEXI. But once it's below, the required, the energy efficiency certificate will be reissued by the 
recognized organization. This required EEXI is based on a fixed score called the EEDI reference line value. It's calculated from the vessel dead weight and type with a reduction value applied to this score, again, based on the vessel dead weight and type. So it's quite a lot to take in and a bit confusing, but uh, let's see an example of a calculation for a Handymax bulk carrier with the following parameters. It's a geared bulk carrier, 58,112 dead weight, a maximum engine power of 8,100 kilowatts that runs on diesel oil. It has a specific fuel oil consumption for the main engine of 168 grams per kilowatt hour. This is a measure of the engine's efficiency and 193 for the auxiliary engines. These parameters are inserted into the equation and the attained EEXI calculated, in this case, 4.52 grams of CO2 per tonne nautical mile. Now we can compare this value to the required value and find out if the vessel is compliant without making any investments into new technologies. First, we calculate the EEDI reference value from the parameters given in MARPOL. Here we can see it's calculated at 5.13. Then we calculate the reduction that needs to be applied. And again, from MARPOL, this is defined as 20% for bulk carriers of this size. And this gives us a required EEXI of 4.11. We then compare the attained and the required. If the attained is below the required, the vessel can move on to compiling the technical file and getting it approved. But if, as it is in this case, the attained EEXI is greater than the required, then the vessel will need to fit additional technologies before recalculating the score. Here we can see a graphic of the example where the blue line is the required EEXI. As you can see, the requirements get stricter the larger the vessel gets. And if a vessel has attained EEXI is below the line, then it's compliant. And of course, if it's above the line, above the required, it's non-compliant. And now we come to the timeline on all this. So the deadline for the calculation and approval of the technical file is by the first renewal of the International Air Pollution Prevention Certificate, the IAPP, after the 1st of January, 2023. This is any renewal of that certificate, meaning the annual, intermediate or full renewal. Therefore, in theory, the latest it can be left is the 31st of December, 2023. And given there is some lead time expected uh, for the administration and verification, we recommend in practice that the latest can be left is three months before that, which in this case is um, September, 2023. To make sense of it, we've got an example vessel here that was delivered on the 13th of March, sorry, 15th of March, 2013, meaning the second full renewal of the IAPP would be due by the 15th of March, 2023, which is when the vessel must have an approved technical file showing an attained EEXI below the required. As you can see, this means there is between just over one to two years before the regulations come into force. So what if the attained EEXI is greater than the required EEXI? What can be done to reduce it? As I mentioned previously, a vessel cannot make operational changes to reduce the EEXI and must fit additional technologies or change the fuel type. Here are some examples of those technologies. The engine power limiter, sometimes referred to as an overridable power limiter, OPL, EPL. This effectively reduces the maximum power of the main engine by placing a physical limiter on the mechanical governors or a software patch limit on electronic governors. Governors are a device on the engines that control the power of the engines by controlling the amount of fuel. The advantages of these EPLs are that they're significantly cheaper compared to the other technologies and can reduce the attained EEXI by almost as much as is required. In theory, should also be little to no off hire time with the installation of an EPL. But the disadvantage, of course, is that if the main engine power is reduced, then the vessel's maximum service speed will also be reduced, potentially affecting the commercial potential of the vessel. These EPLs can be overridden in an emergency, although it's expected that the master will have to justify why the EPL was overridden. Extremely variable depending on vessel type, engine type, engine size, but we estimate the cost of an EPL to be between ten dollars and $50,000. Another example of a device is hull lubrication. 
This is a device that pushes compressed air around the hull to reduce the friction, making the vessel more slippery, therefore requiring less power to achieve the same speed. There's limited data available at the moment as to how much this technology will reduce the EEXI. However, it's anticipated to be less than 5%. So it's an option only really for vessels that are quite close to the required already. Again, extremely variable from vessel to vessel, but we estimate cost to be upwards of $250,000, as well as likely requiring the vessel to dry dock, so quite time consuming. Fuel improvement devices, this covers a range of technologies that aim to make the engines more efficient by improving the combustion processes. Again, the reduction to the EEXI is likely to be limited, and the estimated costs of these are between fifty dollars and $200,000, although no dry docking should be necessary, but there may be some downtime because the vessel's fuel systems will be affected. Motor inverters, one more example. These are variable frequency drives. They're fitted to reduce the speeds of large electrical motors on the vessels when they're not required to be running at full speed. For example, if a vessel is traveling in cold water, it might not require the full flow from the seawater cooling pumps. Therefore, these pumps can be slowed down, saving energy. Again, a highly variable cost estimate of between $100,000 and $200,000. And although there should be no dry docking required, there might be some disruption to the vessel's working schedule while they're installed. There are other examples, but given the cost and the work required, the option that's likely to be the most popular is the EPL. So here we have an example of the EEXI trajectory of a vessel with and without taking measures to reduce the EEXI in the form of an engine power limiter. Currently, as you can see, the vessel has an attained EEXI of around 5.6, 5.7. And when the regulations come into force in 2023, we can see that the vessel will be just above the required and well above a further anticipated reduction in 2026. This anticipated reduction is represented as a dotted line, as we have no confirmation yet as to how much this reduction will be. Now with an EPL fitted, the vessel is well below the required for 2023 and may even be below after the further anticipated reduction in 2026. So that sums up the basics of what EEXI is. I'll hand you back now to Adam. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stefan. So hopefully now, with a bit of a better understanding of the upcoming regulations, we'd like to ask our audience a question. And you should see a live poll as appeared on the screens where we are asking how many of our audience with a direct uh, stake in shipping, whether that be as an owner, a manager or perhaps a financier of a vessel, how many have already started to calculate your EEXI scores? It'd be great to get as much feedback on this as possible and we'll run through the results shortly. Now, before we finish then, we'll touch on the likely impact of the EEXI regulations. Truthfully, the impact of the EEXI regulations on the global fleet will not be fully realized until the regulations have come into force and afterwards. However, we have started to do some analysis and so far, approximately 70% of the vessels for which we have conducted calculations will require some form of technological intervention to reduce the EEXI score. To help get a more accurate understanding of the impact, we are currently analyzing the attained EEXI of an even larger data set of vessels the results of which we will be sharing at an upcoming Idwell Insights webinar, where it'd be great to have you back with us to review the findings. We anticipate that it will remain the case that a high proportion of applicable vessels will still not meet the required criteria. And given the relatively short space of time left to recalculate and lower the scores, the changes are likely to be some of the most impactful for a long time in the industry. Now that concludes the first presentation in our climate action series, and we'll shortly host a bit of a Q&A. However, before doing so, I'd like to take the time to thank you all again for joining us and for your valuable feedback on the poll. Glancing at the results, I can see 34% have taken the proactive approach and have already started to calculate their EEXI scores, which is fantastic. While 66% have yet to start calculating their EEXI scores. Now, for those who haven't yet started, or indeed, if you'd just like to validate your internal calculations, 
I'm pleased to confirm that Idwell have recently launched a free to use EEXI calculator, which you can use at any time. This calculator has been designed to help you decipher the rather complex EEXI formula by simply requiring the user to enter some key parameters related to a particular vessel. This will send an accurate score directly to your mailbox within minutes. It's a fully automated, free to use tool that can be accessed via our website at idwellmarine.com forward slash EEXI. And I fully encourage you to test it for yourselves. And afterwards, you'll be very interested to discuss your results in more detail and offer advice and support when needed to help guide you towards full compliance in 2023 and beyond. To further increase transparency in the market, IDWELL will now also be including EEXI and CII scores in all of our inspection reports as standard. Again, at no additional cost. Through the act of boarding a vessel for an inspection, we are able to directly access the real-time data required to generate real-time EEXI scores, making IDWELL the most accurate EEXI tool in the market today. It is our goal to help the industry go above and beyond compliance. And so we're continuously developing new products to offer valuable information for stakeholders to make informed decisions and plan for the challenges ahead. So keep an eye on this space. And if there's anything specifically we can do to help you assess the compliance of your fleet, please do reach out to us. Now, before we disappear, we would like to host a little bit of a Q&A session. As I said earlier, if you haven't already spotted it, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try and get through as many of the questions we can over the next five to 10 minutes. Great, thank you. So Stefan, we have a question here. Um, so one member of our audience says, fitting EPL affects service speed. Does hull fluid dynamics have to be reassessed, such as reshaped bulbous spout or propeller flow improvers? That's a good question. Um, as it affects the service speed, bulbous bows are generally fitted to vessels which are designed to operate most of the time at maximum service speed, so they require a certain amount of speed to create the interference wave, and the same with propeller flow improvers like newest Turks pre-swirl technology. However, the EPLs from our, from our initial calculations, the, re the requirement of, of the EPLs will not be drastic, so the, the reductions of speed won't be drastic, therefore the fluid dynamics, it, they will be affected, but to the point where reshaped, reshaping the bulbous bow, probably unlikely. Excellent, thank you very much. I hope that sufficiently answered your question. So we've got a couple here. So do I have to calculate my EEXI twice before and after installing new technologies? Uh, yes, you have to calculate it twice because how would you know if you need to install technologies, but you wouldn't have to have the uh, calculation verified until you knew it was below the required. Fantastic. Thank you. So will this webinar content be available offline? The answer to that is absolutely. We will be sending around this webinar after uh, completion today. Will anyone consider lowering carrying capacity dead weight? Reducing a vessel's dead weight? The EEXI is based on a vessel's potential to carry. So the actual amount of cargo you decide to carry isn't applicable. It's only the amount the vessel can carry. So the dead weight, you can reduce a vessel's dead weight um, that if you want to make structural changes, which will be quite costly, but also the required EEXI is based on the dead weight as a vessel as well. So it's likely that the required will drop. Um, the required will go up but also the attained EXI will go up as well. It's quite complicated. It seems like there'd be quite an involved process to change the dead weight of a vessel. Excellent. Thank you very much. So this is an important question. 
what are the impacts of breaching EEXI after January 2023? What happens to the owner slash manager? So uh, EEXI uh, requires to be policed like any other regulation uh, in the industry, which is to say by port state authorities on the whole, um, flag authorities. Um, as, it's, as I said at the start, the International Energy Efficiency Certificate would be reissued if the vessel that goes to port has a port state inspection. One of the first things they'll do is check all the certificates. And if they see that the energy efficiency certificate has not been reissued after the date that the renewal of the IAPP, then the vessel would face sanctions in line with any other um, deficiencies of port state, maybe just a deficiency um, or maybe up to detentions and fines. Very good. Thank you very much. So are the IMO likely to agree any small amendments to EEXI regulations in 2022? Um, maybe. It seems unlikely given the IMO's commitment to the uh, decarbonisation in shipping. They have um, three measures, short term, medium and long term. We don't know much about the medium or long term at the moment. These, the EXI and CII regulations are short term measures. Um, so it's unlikely that they'll budge on uh, on the changes, but there might be some small changes. Yeah, it's impossible to know for sure. Great. So we'll try and grab one or two more questions then. Thank you very much for the interesting questions, by the way. Does the 20% reduction require, required affect every vessel? then how could any vessel already meet the requirements? So the 20% reduction is a reduction on the uh, EEDI reference line, not on the attained EEXI, not on the calculated for the vessel. And the 20% in that case, in the, our example, only applies to bulk carriers between 20,000 and 200,000. Um, there is a reduction on that reference value for all ship types, but it's different. It ranges from a 0% reduction up to about a 35 or 45% reduction, I believe, for some uh, large containers of vessels. Great. So what is the difference between EEXI and CII? Um, good question. EEXI is applicable to the how the vessel is built, not how it's operated. So it's a measurement of the potential energy efficiency of the vessel, not the actual. CII is a measure of the operational, the actual uh, energy efficiency, the actual amount of carbon outputted from that vessel um, over a year using actual data of fuel consumption and distance traveled over a year. And just to add on to that point, CII will be a feature at one of our future Climate Action Series webinars. So keep an eye out for that if you're interested in the carbon intensity index. And I believe we will wrap up there. Sorry if we didn't get round to all your questions. Well, there was a lot of engagement there, so thank you all very much. Um, we are available after the webinar, so please do reach out if we did not get around to answering your question. So now we certainly hope that this has been found useful and insightful and puts our audience in a better position to be tackling the issue of EEXI in the near future. As always, as I just said, if there are any questions that we didn't have a chance to answer today or if any more arise after the webinar, do contact us and we'll be more than happy to help. For those celebrating, we hope you have a happy holiday season and if we don't have a chance to speak before then, I look forward to catching up with many of you in the new year. Stay safe and see you at the next Idwell Insights webinar in the coming months.